言论自由。I'm Katie Engelhart, and I'm Brian Pellet. Welcome to our monthly podcast on free speech. Each month, we'll bring you a selection of highlights, interviews, and case studies from FreeSpeechDebate.com, a project based at the University of Oxford. This month, we launched with an event in Oxford featuring Wikipedia co-founder Jimmy Wales, just hours after the Wiki blackout. We also aired a special message from Iranian Nobel Peace Prize winner Shirin Ebadi. More on that later. We'll hear Victor Meyer Schoenberger discuss his latest book, Delete. And sit down with FSD member Casey Selwyn to talk about AIDS denialism in South Africa. We'll wrap up with some initial feedback from our readers, but first off, let's look at a few interviews on our site. There's another form of speech that brings about violence, which should be captured in these principles. It's a form of speech that can be very powerful, very destructive. And that I have, in fact, nicknamed dangerous speech. That was Susan Benesh, senior fellow at the World Policy Institute. Her research looks at the link between speech and violence. Here's Susan again with five criteria for determining when speech can be considered dangerous. The first is the speaker. Some speakers, as we all know, are much more compelling, and therefore, if they use intimidating, violent, inciting speech, then that speech is more dangerous when spoken by some people. The second is the audience. Some audiences are more likely to react violently for a whole set of reasons. The content of the the speech itself, of course, is important. Some speech is more dangerous than others simply because of what it says. The fourth criterion is the historical and social context, and the fifth is the mode of dissemination. Next up, we have Professor Yan Shui Tong, director of the Institute of International Studies at Tsinghua University, speaking on universal values. The universally accepted set of ethics and value system do exist. For example, honesty and loyalty are values common to all religions and cultures. The act of betrayal is universally condemned. A universal set of values definitely exists. What does it constitute? It varies from one perspective to another. It is to be determined by collective behavior and majority consensus. It is not to be decided by one group of people or a few communities. In other words, for ethics and values to be considered as universal, at least half of the world should accept them. And finally, Max Mosley. The former president of Formula One's governing body found himself at the center of a privacy debate in 2008 after the now defunct News of the World tabloid published a front-page story about his alleged orgy with five prostitutes. The paper claimed the orgy was Nazi-themed, an allegation later dismissed by a judge. Here's Mosley describing how he felt when he first saw the story splashed across the tabloid's front page. Touch wood, I've never been burgled. But I imagine it's like coming home and finding your whole house has been ransacked.、Mm-hmm. Somebody's invaded everything that's most private to you.、Mm-hmm. Like that, only far worse,、mm-hmm. because you know that everybody in the country, everybody in the street, everybody you can see, all know. In the interview, Mosley makes a sharp distinction between a defamatory statement and one that infringes on privacy.、And、I think defamation is much easier than privacy because, in contrast to privacy, a defamatory statement can be corrected. In contrast to privacy, once something private has been revealed, no power on earth can make it private again. I mean, for example, in my case, having said that I took part in an orgy, if then the following week they come out. With a huge apology on the front page, saying, "We're really sorry we revealed Mr. Moses' orgy. In fact, it was private, and we shouldn't have revealed it. It's really no help to me." Since 2008, Moseley has attempted to purge all traces of the story from the web. He has lawyers in 20 countries who have successfully removed content from close to 200 websites. You can hear the full interviews under the Watch and Listen tab at FreeSpeechDebate.com. Our liveliest debate took place at our Oxford launch event, featuring Wikipedia co-founder Jimmy Wales. Wikipedia was the most prominent site to shut down on January 18th in protest of two controversial anti-piracy bills making their way through the U.S. government. We talked to Jimmy Wales hours after the site came back online. Timothy Garton Nash press Wales on SOPA and PIPA, the Wiki blackout, and a proposed image filter on Wikipedia. Images have been among the most controversial topics on Wikipedia, and discussions about whether to use filters are ongoing. Here's Wales on why he endorses image filters. 
it's valuable for us to provide tools that allow users to control their own experience because I think that's the most conducive to uh, broad education. What I would set for myself when I'm working in a public place is quite a strict filter. Uh, violence, sexuality, anything that you, you might not feel comfortable with your grandmother looking over your shoulder or your six-year-old child looking over your shoulder. I'll just take that and filter it. What that does is just collapse it behind a, a JavaScript click. The conversation then turned to SOPA and PIPA. Wales kicked off by criticizing the U.S. government for fighting internet censorship abroad, but backing it at home. So it's quite ironic, then, that this bill, at least in some versions, contemplated setting up DNS filtering in the U.S. and also had a provision banning methods for technical circumvention, i.e. the very projects that the U.S. government is funding. Wales also took a swing at Hollywood. He indicted the entertainment industry for lobbying Washington to pass these bills. He accused them of exaggerating the online piracy problem and of exploiting nationalism to advance their cause. In their rhetoric around this, and, and I think it's an attempt to sell it to the taxpayers, they talk about American jobs and American intellectual property and rogue foreign sites. And I just think these are global companies who, if they could find a cheap Chinese Tom Cruise, they would replace him in a heartbeat. We broadcast a special message from Nobel Peace Prize winner Shirin Abadi. Abadi warned that all 10 of our principles would be problematic for the Iranian government. She added that while free speech is enshrined in the Iranian constitution, it is severely limited in common law. As a result, films, plays, and books are all subject to the censor's blade. We wrapped up the evening at Oxford's Bodleian Library, a stone's throw from one of England's last book burnings in 1683. From ancient book burnings to perfect digital memory. Katie and I met with Victor Meyer Schoenberger, author of Delete, The Virtue of Forgetting in the Digital Age. We visited Victor in his office at the Oxford Internet Institute, where he is Professor of Internet Governance and Regulation. Thanks for joining us, Victor. Most welcome. Uh, you opened Delete with the story of Stacy Snyder. Tell us what happened to her. Stacy Snyder was a young woman uh, wanting to become a teacher in the U.S., and she had basically completed all her training uh, and was waiting for her teacher certificate when she was summoned to the dean of her university and told that she would not get her teacher's certificate because of her behavior. And when she queried what her behavior was, she was told that she had posted a photo of herself on her MySpace webpage for her friends to see and perhaps to chuckle. But this photo, the university administration found to be unbecoming of a teacher because it showed her with a pirate hat and a plastic cup and it was captioned, Drunken Pirate. Never mind that Stacy, of course, was an, of legal drinking age and all that, but the university was adamant that this photo could be found by kids and therefore was unbecoming of a teacher. And Stacy volunteered to take the photo down, but, but the damage was done because at that time the photo had been archived by, by the web archive and crawled by web crawlers. Just like Stacy, I'm a student in my 20s, and I think all of us have some compromising photos out there somewhere on the Internet. If we're all in the same position, do we really need to be worried about this self-censoring? Well, it turns out that not all of us have these compromising photos. And not all of our compromising photos are out there. Uh, many of my students, for example, have more than one Facebook account, one that is very clean and tidied and curated for potential employers or their parents, and another one that is rather messy and that is for their friends and that only uses their nickname. And so they're trying to create boundaries or hurdles for some of these compromising photographs to get out. Well, it's interesting you mentioned people with dual Facebook accounts. I lived for a short time in Berlin, and I noticed this is something more particular to Germans than to, say, North Americans, this division of identities. Is this something you've noticed? I haven't noticed that. In fact, I know of almost all of the top universities in the United States that uh, provide for their freshman students uh, courses in how to curate Facebook accounts and what to do with social media. And that tells me that A, there is a market in the U.S., and B, there's a need in the U.S. as well as in Europe. Okay, so I just want to sort of bring this back to the book. In Delete, you talk about the right to be forgotten. Why do you think it's so important for humans to forget? There's two major dimensions that are important. One, of course, is the relational dimension, and that is if we forget something in our past but others don't, 
then they have potential power over us, relational power over us. We call that informational power and information privacy. Specialist experts have long talked about this. If the Stasi or the secret police or secret agents have information about us, if the government has information about us, they might be able to coerce us. They might be able to do things to us that we might not like. That's one dimension, but one that, as I was doing my research, became less and less concerned. Compared with the other one, which I discovered was sort of the, the big iceberg. We, we only see the tip, most of it is underneath the water. And that has to do with the important function that forgetting has for us. Because as we forget, we make it bearable for us humans to live in the present and to take decisions in the present. People who have physiological difficulties to forget, biological difficulties to forget, when you interview them, when you ask them how they feel, they say, it is very hard for me to make a decision because whenever I am faced with a decision in the present, I remember all my failed decisions of the past. Uh, you talk about someone in your book, you talk about AJ, this 41-year-old woman who is plagued by perfect memory. For her, remembering was a curse in all forms. But for me, I think it's a blessing that I can just go into my inbox and I don't have this perfect memory, pull up an email that's three years old and recount a specific cafe I went to, a specific book I read, what are some of the other benefits to increased memory, and do you consider these benefits? Oh yeah, there are a number of benefits, but there is a, an important distinction between AJ's situation and your situation. In your case, you deliberately want to remember something. You go to your inbox and you query it. With AJ, the moment she is confronted with the situation, her remembering is automatic. You can stop yourself going to your inbox and querying it. And that means you have choice of when you want to remember and what you want to remember. And what I am concerned about is that in the future we might not have a choice anymore because the tools surrounding us capture everything, but they also confront us continuously with the memory that surrounds us. At the same time, it's very clear that platforms like Facebook are moving in the opposite direction. Randy Zuckerberg, Facebook's marketing director, said last July, quote, I think anonymity on the internet has to go away. I found that pretty chilling, um, but her argument is that people hide behind anonymity, that online discussion is best and people are held accountable for their comments. What would you say to this policy? Well, I would point them to the situation in many totalitarian regimes where, in fact, anonymous speech, either through leaflets or through other publications that don't reveal their sources, are a very, very important source of motivating organizing, energizing dissent. And I would not want to personally live in a society in which there isn't any anonymity anymore. Uh, anonymity or pseudo-anonymity gives us some comfort. And in fact, in the real life, we have levels of anonymity all the time. If we go into a shop where they don't know our name, we pay with anonymous cash rather than a credit card or a debit card. That is an anonymous or semi-anonymous transaction. Why would we want to do away with that? I think the benefits of a perfect identity and authenticity are completely unproven. How and when do you think the balance tipped from forgetting to remembering being the norm? The tipping point, I think, happened when remembering became cheaper than forgetting. And that was for different types of information about maybe 10, 15 years ago for some information that contain a lot of bits, like video, it was paid maybe five years ago. But there was a tipping point where it was cheaper to just capture and keep all of the digital photos, all of the video footage that we, we take and we record, put it on the hard disk rather than actually spending the time going through and deciding whether or not to keep a photograph or to keep a video. There was a New York Times article a little while ago. It suggested that we're kind of reverting to a pre-medieval era where our identities are absolutely fixed by geography, class, those sorts of factors. I'm wondering if mm -hmm. you think the internet is making it impossible for us to reinvent ourselves again. The internet makes it much harder to reinvent ourselves. And reinvention has been a mainstay for many centuries. In fact, our names weren't fixed until the mid-19th century. And even today in North America, you can change your last name. It's very hard to do that in Europe, but it's perfectly easy to do that in the United States. That permits you to start a new life, and there is a real reason for that. You can start fresh. You get a new name, you move to a different place, you have another chance. 
I'm hoping we can talk about solutions. One of the ideas you propose and delete is a kind of expiration date on information. Another is a kind of digital abstinence, which I must admit I find to be a rather unrealistic proposition. I'm wondering what you think the solution is to all this and who you think is going to sign on. Well, in the book, I describe six solutions that have been tried already with varying degrees of success. One of them is digital abstinence. And President Obama suggested if we should self-censor on Facebook and other social media, I don't think as well as you do that this is a, a suitable proposition going forward. I do think we need to do better than that. The problem is that there really isn't a perfect solution. We need to sort of combine some of them like information or data ecology, reducing the amount of data that we have in the first place, or creating information privacy rights that are actually being enforced. But none of them actually are silver bullets going forward. And so perhaps what we need is to give forgetting a second chance, and that is to create organizational, structural, legal, individual, and technical mechanisms by which we make forgetting just a little bit easier and remembering just a little bit harder and more costly. And another one uh, that uh, might help as a good metaphor is what I call the digital shoebox in the attic. So if you remember analog love letters that you received and what happens with them is you put them in a box and you put them in the basement or the attic and they're there and if you want to reminiscence and then you can take the box out and go through them and sort of remember. But that is a deliberate attempt of remembering. The problem that I have currently is that when I query my inbox for a, an email that I sent three weeks ago, in pop also emails that I sent 10 years ago and 15 years ago that then distract me and begin to suck me into the past that I don't want to remember at this point. And so one way around this is just to create an equivalent of the shoebox in the attic and that is to take emails that are older than three years or, and put them on an external hard drive and put the external hard drive in the attic. It seems you want the internet to better mimic the human mind. Indeed, or to better mimic the human nature. And that has to do with the fact that I, as I'm looking at it, the way our brain works is very hard to change. And technology is enormously plastic. I can change technology much easier. A lot of what we're talking about is this private memory, but what about the sort of public collective memory that comes up when you Google my name and autocomplete results adds other identity tags at the end? How can we control this? I believe that expiration dates, for example, would help in that context as well. But there is no question that we see a shift in the institutions of remembering. And the shift is happening right now. It moves from societal institutions like archives and museums and libraries toward its commercial institutions like Google. Google Books is another or one of those phenomenons where they begin to create a commercial platform for memory. And I find that somewhat troubling. I think we as a society should have the final say in what we want to remember and who we want societally to remember. All right, thanks for chatting with us, Victor. Most welcome. Every month, we'll bring in an FSD team member to talk about one of our case studies. This week, we've got Casey Selwyn, graduate student of international relations, to discuss AIDS denialism in South Africa. Welcome to the show, Casey. Thank you. First, why don't you tell us about the case? Okay, so AIDS denialism in general is a movement that claims that HIV does not cause AIDS and that antiretroviral drugs, which are the most effective available method of treating AIDS to date, are poisonous and promoted by a pharmaceutical industry that's only interested in profit. It's been discredited in every credible scientific forum as false, but in South Africa, which has one of the most severe AIDS epidemic in the world, from the years 1999 to 2000, Thabo Mobeki was president, and him and his health minister promoted this idea of AIDS denialism as truth, and as a result, refused to roll out antiretroviral drugs, and he often appealed to principles of free speech as justification for questioning the origin of AIDS and treatment, and public health researchers estimate that approximately 343,000 AIDS-related deaths are attributable to South Africa's endorsement of denialism. So given how severe AIDS is in South Africa, do you think that this might be a case where public interest should trump free speech rights? And I guess if so, where do we draw that line? 
I think at first it was difficult for me to square this case study with a project about free speech because I do believe that in this case public interest was severely damaged by AIDS denialism and the so-called allowance of Mbeki to freely speak his views on AIDS and question its scientific origins. But on thinking about it more, I do think that had there been some sort of ban, which I think logistically would be very difficult, especially when you have the president endorsing this type of viewpoint, if there was some sort of ban at um, a national level, then I think it probably just would have given this group more of a platform to denounce the scientific origins of AIDS. Okay, so on a slightly different note, the director of free speech debate, Timothy Garton Nash, has taken a strong stand against laws that criminalize Holocaust denial. I'm wondering if we can draw a parallel between AIDS denialism and Holocaust denial. Yeah, I mean, I think you have to be careful to draw a direct parallel because obviously in this case, AIDS denial had a pretty immediate practical consequence that resulted in death of hundreds of thousands of people. And Holocaust denial is a contested issue in terms of respecting the history that obviously is an incredibly gruesome and atrocious history, but there is sort of an immediacy to the denying of AIDS in this context that separates it. At the same time, I do think if you're talking about denialism in general, to set a precedent where you say you can deny deny this and not this, or denialism is okay if you believe the right thing. I think that that's kind of a slippery slope. So just to wrap up, what is the state of AIDS denialism today? It's interesting because South Africa now has actually quite progressive AIDS and antiretroviral policies, but in the world at large, again, in respectable scientific academic fora, the concept of HIV not causing AIDS is completely debunked. But what's interesting is because of the internet and because of blogs and sort of alternative forums for expressing ideas, AIDS denialists and particularly one guy, Peter Duisberg, and all of his ideas have been taken on by another generation of so-called dissidents that are questioning the efficacy of antiretrovirals and the science of AIDS. Thanks for joining us, Casey. You can respond to Casey under case studies at freespeechdebate.com. We've had some interesting comments come in since our launch. User Manish Microbe weighed in on Living with Difference, a discussion tied to Principle 4, which states, We speak openly and with civility about all kinds of human difference. Manish Microbe wrote, My only worry associated with this proposed civil, courteous, free speech is the remarkable ability of the same spoken language to be simultaneously civil and uncivil to different audiences. Another user responded to a discussion on the right to freedom of information. User John Q1 wrote, The onus should be upon the public bodies to actively publish any material as it is created, together with a statement of public resources which have been expended. We've left our 11th principle open for you to tell us what we've missed. If you have an idea for a universal principle on free speech, let us know at freespeechdebate.com. Stepping back from the website for a moment, Brian, what's this month's free speech indicator? 162 million. That's the number of people who visited Wikipedia the day the site went black. That's six times more than the number of average visitors per day. More than 7,000 sites joined the online protest, 4.5 million people signed Google's anti-censorship petition, and 18 senators withdrew support from the Protect IP Act. We'll be bringing you a free speech indicator every month. In the meantime, Katie, why don't you tell us what's coming up in the next few weeks? On February 20th, we've got an exciting event on Facebook and privacy. Lord Richard Allen, Director of European Policy at Facebook, will join us in Oxford and go head-to-head with Victor Meyer Schoenberger. We'll also be posting new expert interviews. To name a few, we've got lawyer and publisher Ezra Levant on why he doesn't believe in hate speech, and Richard Stallman, founder of the free software movement, on why Apple and Microsoft are evil. You can follow us on Twitter at OnFreeSpeech at facebook.com slash freespeechdebate, and of course on our website, freespeechdebate.com. Until next month, goodbye. Do svidaniya. Kudafis. Adios.